Good evening and welcome to the Lord Hartman's public lecture on the rise and fall of shareholder rights in America. It's my pleasure to chair the event. My name is Carson Anabola. I'm uh, based at UCL, Faculty of Law. Okay, there are some smiles here in the audience because I also have a past with LSD, so it feels oddly familiar and nice to be back here. So I, I will I will explain a little bit about just just very briefly about the context of tonight's lecture and about the procedure. We will learn about a number of fundamental shifts in um, Delaware corporate law that have occurred over the last just few years, two or three years or so and that have amplified or eroded, as some, some would say, central tenets of investor protection law that the Delaware courts erected, have erected since the, since the 1980s or so. And this development has been applauded, I, I would think, by, by some who see it as an important safeguard against um, excessive shareholder activism, against frivolous litigation, the explosion of real litigation um, that we will probably hear a bit about tonight. And it has been criticized heavily by others who have the concern that managerial discretion is now largely left unchecked. There will be probably a lot of talk about Delaware case law. And some of the developments are specific to Delaware, I suppose, but they concern a much more fundamental question, which is very much relevant. I think, in Europe, and also very much, very, very much as controversial, I would think, in Europe as it is in the United States, and that is how to allocate corporate power between shareholders and directors, how to calibrate the relationship between these two corporate constituencies in order to ensure that, on the one hand, shareholders are sufficiently, investors are sufficiently well protected, and on the other hand, in order to also ensure that directors and managers have sufficient leeway in order to resist short-term pressures in order to counteract frivolous litigation, etc. So we have a brilliant panel here, which is actually not yet quite complete, but you probably most of you know the missing person. Here he comes. So we have a brilliant panel in order to pursue these considerations from, from, a, from a comparative perspective. Our main speaker is Jim Cox. Jim is the Brainerd Curry Professor of Law at Duke Law School, and he's also currently a visiting professor at LSE, just arrived yep. from the United States. Um, Jim's accomplishments are too numerous to, to list them all here now, so I'll, I'll just mention a few, and I'll be necessarily incomplete. I suppose Jim is one of the leading experts on corporate law and securities regulation in the in the United States. He has published several leading textbooks on both corporate law and securities regulation and numerous articles. In addition to his scholarly work, he has been involved in corporate law making. He has been a member of um, corporate law committees in the states of legislation committees in the state of California and North Carolina. He has been or he is a member of a number of legal advisory boards of the New York Stock Exchange, the, the National Association of Securities Dealers and of the, of the company County Oversight Board. His, his work has been hugely influential. I think uh, you can say that without any exaggeration whatsoever. It has been very influential both in academic circles where it has shaped the, the debate about central concepts of securities regulation has been also very influential in, in policy making circles with the with the SEC and it is being referred to regularly by the courts all the way up to the US Supreme Court. I think recently for example in the decision on the fraud on the market theory. Um, so his his influence um, cannot be overstated, I think. We then have two respondents. I think Jim will go for about uh, 30 minutes or so, um, 20 to 30 minutes. We have two, two respondents. Um, first, David Kirscher, who most of you, or all of you, I suppose, know, so I don't really need, you don't need much introduction, do you? <laughs> <laughs> all right, and then um, Tobias Tröger, he holds the chair in uh, private law 
Business and, and Trade Law at the University of Frankfurt. He's an expert on corporate governance and corporate finance. Um, he has published widely in these areas on comparative corporate governance, on German corporate governance, corporate <coughs> groups, on banking regulation, on also contract law, I think, and contract theory. So very grateful that, that you're, you're all here, and I'm very much looking forward to tonight's event. Thank you. Tim, you have the floor. So I'm going to stand up. I, I literally arrived just a few hours ago. I'm afraid if I sit there, I'll start falling asleep in my own address. And so I thought that this was. And the other thing I'm going to say, I just want to reassure everybody that I don't have an accent, but you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're there. So just to introduce the subject a little bit, because we're all sort of coming from different backgrounds, perhaps. Uh, so Delaware is a state that's probably just about the size geographically. Of, of metropolitan London, I would think. I mean, the, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, remote area. But it has undue influence on, on the law, corporate law in America, because a little over half the public companies are incorporated there. And what we find is that with our newest business form, the limited liability company that didn't come into existence until 1977, and is now very popular for very small organizations, that it is the leading uh, venue for small companies. And, 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 and then, because of its court system, uh, most corporate litigation is in Delaware. I mean, I, I didn't really realize that we had a federal corporate law until I started writing a treatise on corporate law about 15 years ago. And we do. It's called the Law of Delaware. Uh, and, and, and the reason I say that is that most opinions are Delaware opinions, and those that are not from Delaware start off generally by saying, well, we don't get a lot of corporate law cases in, in California or Illinois or Texas, but we start off with the presumption that we're going to start off that whatever Delaware said about this, we sort of think that's a good thing unless it conflicts with local public policy. <coughs> now, as you know, the United States is a, a well, it's screwed up government system right now, but it's a federal system, uh, and uh, we have states have historically had control of corporate law. But the, uh, for almost now 90 years, the dominant force has been Delaware. And the right to passage for anybody who's taken an American corporate law class is to understand a quartet of cases we call in our paper the Golden Quartet. They were cases in the break and take era of the 1980s. Um, and they were the Revlon, okay. Uh, there's a case, Weinberger, I'll unpack all these later. Um, there's the, the case of Unical and Blossius. And what you find is these were cases were decided in the 80s, and they really did push out shareholder rights, but mainly through the idea of shareholder protection. And shareholder protection means a lot in America because we have a system that encourages litigation, okay? And the most powerful force is we have something called the American rule, okay? And the American rule means it applies in America and no other place, and it means that you pay your own litigation costs. It's not a loser pay system. So a tremendous governor on litigation is if you sue and you lose, you have to pay the other side because it certainly catches your attention. So we have that. Of course, we have the class action device in which you can have claims aggregated uh, and brought. And we also have the contingency fee arrangement. Well, when you put those, and that means that the lawyers front the cost of these matters, lawyers can be very risk preferring because you run a stable of cases of you know, based on portfolio theory and you only have to win on one or two, okay, out of 20 or 25 you initiate, and you not only have a good life, you have a great life, okay? And uh, so they front the cost on these things. So if you don't have loser pay, uh, and you don't have class action, and, um, uh, and you have no contingency fees, you don't have to worry about shareholder litigation, okay? But we have all three of those, and so that's, that's a big concern. So when these cases, the Golden Quartet was decided in the 80s, they created rights. And rights are just crying out for enforcement, okay? And just to paint the environment that 
if you went back about a dozen years, you found that, you know, case, cases attacking deals were frequent but not of epidemic proportions. If you went back only five years ago, you find that cases attracting mergers, acquisitions, recapitalization, uh, restructurings, what have you, were attacking almost 99% of the cases, okay? Now that suddenly, did conduct just suddenly become really bad? So you had a few cases being brought one time and then you go forward about eight years and you have almost all cases being brought? Probably not, <coughs> probably not. Uh, and so the question is, how do you put the genie back in the bottle? That is, we have an epidemic of deal litigation, and one way you can do that is by changing the standards. And I'll come back to that in a moment, and I explain some of the developments in the corporate quartet. But we would be talking about four cases that I'm about to talk about if that was the explanation for every one of them. There's something else uh, afoot here. So let me take you through the, 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 these cases. The first one is Revlon. And what I teach my students, I tell them, are you in the Revlon moment, okay? Now what does the Revlon moment mean? It means that when you have a transfer of control, the objective of the board of directors is to negotiate, that is the company that is going to be selling control, to negotiate for the best deal possible, to search around for the best deal possible, and become like auctioneers. So what that's changes for when you're in the Revlon moment is your North Star is to, for the board of directors to pursue strategies and conduct that will achieve the best deal for the company. You shop the firm, okay? Now, normally the North Star in America is to uh, maximize shareholder value generally, or better yet, just get the best profits possible. But when you're in the sale control situation, your North Star is get the best Deal. The best deal doesn't necessarily mean the best price. Maybe you get 90, you're being offered $95 to your shareholders, but that's only for 80% of the shares. But maybe the best price is to sell 100% of them for $90, okay? So you know, there's an element of judgment that comes to play there. But if you're in the Revlon moment, then you have to get the, the best price. Well, you can imagine that as deals, and I'll talk about this later, uh, well, as deals started becoming more and more one deal, you know, uh, one bidder and one company to be acquired, you didn't have competing bidders, that suddenly the allegations would be, well, you should have been looking around, you should, if Alpha's going to acquire Beta, Beta should have been looking for somebody other than Alpha, okay? Should go out and beat the bushes, hire your investment bankers, find another person like that, and file a lawsuit. And that's what was happening. When you find a deal litigation going up to 99%, they were all cases of saying you violated your Revlon duties and uh, responsibilities by not looking for a better deal, okay? So the suits are in. So that's the Revlon. Well then, in the last two or three years, the Delaware courts have changed that. They first changed it by saying, look, one thing we have to realize here is that the board of directors still is entitled to the presumptions of a business judgment rule. Business judgment <coughs> rule is the major way of protecting directors from, if they make a bad decision or a decision turns out to be wrong, okay, they're not going to be liable for the consequences of that as long as they had a rational basis for doing so. Uh, you know, I always like to point out to my students, there's a big difference between the words reasonable and rational. All they need is a rational basis, okay? If I say you're being unreasonable, okay, that's part of the argument, right? But if I say you're being not rational, that's really inflammatory. That says that there's no school of thought that supports whatever you say. So you can be rational and believe that there's no global warming because there is a small school of thought out there, known as the White House, um, <laughs> that, believes, that believes, believes that there's no global warming and man's not no responsibility, blah, 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 okay? Like that. So that's, that's a huge protection if all the board has to do is have a rational purpose to come forward with it. So, so the Delaware court in the CMJ energy case just a couple of years ago said, look, the mere fact that you're in the Revlon moment, we still have a chance for the board of directors to show its skill, its experience, its, uh, and we're going to defer to them. And so what happened there is they had a single bidder buying the company at a modest premium, and the bidder said, 
No shop. You can't shop the firm. And also, we want to have a breakup fee. If it turns out that somebody else comes in and takes it over, you've got to pay a couple hundred million dollars. Okay. So a plaintiff comes in and says, well, gee, you didn't fulfill your Revlon moment of looking for the best deal because what happened is that you said you wouldn't shop, be aggressive and shop for anybody else. And you also uh, agreed that if somebody else did come in and you accepted a higher offer, that you would pay them a couple hundred million dollars. Now think, you, you know what a breakup fee is, it just is a tick mark. I mean, it's like a bidding. And, uh, on a stock exchange, if you have a firm and their alpha is going to acquire beta, and beta agrees that if somebody else comes to like Omega and pays, buys them, that al beta is going to have to pay alpha $200 million. Well, what that means is that the next bid has to be at least $200 million <coughs> higher than the first bid to make it all break, break even, okay? So it's a tick mark. What the Delaware court said in the CNJ Energy case said, look, the board of directors looked at this thing and they agreed to be able to get this deal. They said, we're not going to go out and we're not going to hire Goldman Sachs, okay, and shop the firm. We, we're not going to do that. And we agree that if somebody else comes along and we accept their offer, that we'll pay you $200 million, okay? But the deal wouldn't close for five months. And the court said, Ah, the board of directors realized they had five months for somebody else to come in and make an offer to them that would be above the break breakup point. And as a consequence, the board of directors exercises business judgment and Revlon is satisfied. Okay. So that was amelioration. But the big one, the big case is turning uh, corporate law on its heads in Delaware, and I suggest in America, is the Corwin case. And that was decided just a year and a half ago. Corwin said the following. Look, single bidder situation, beta is going to be acquired by Alpha, and the shareholders approved. <clears throat> and with a fully informed vote, they were closed all the terms of the deal. There was no coercion, no threats against the shareholders. And as a result, if you have a fully informed, non coerced vote of the shareholders, there can't be any breach of fiduciary duty, i.e. Revlon cannot be invoked to say the deal is a bad deal, okay? So therefore, that means that going forward in American company, what you want to do is you're going to have a single bidder, and then you're going to submit it to the shareholders, have them prove it. Think about the shareholders, there's some compulsion there. They got this deal before the deal before the bid came along, stock was at 20. They're offering 25. Huh? Bird in the hand, right? Rather than one in the bush. And so the shareholders vote. So by bundling these things together, you now have the curative effects of a shareholder plebiscite that blesses the deal. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Revlon. Okay? So that's the Rev Revlon. So what, ex what explains this? Well, some of this, I think, some of this that explains why the court backed off is just the litigation explosion. So finding that, you know, not 96 to 99 percent, depending on whose database you looked at, uh, the deals are challenged, okay, in litigation. Uh, and many of those suits are dismissed. Uh, many of those case suits are settled. And they're settled on grounds of paying the attorney's fees, not money on the table, paying attorney's fees, and some sort of cosmetic disclosures that are going to be made, supplementary proxy statement that's going to be sent out to the shareholders, and the attorneys get paid. I mean, it has a very <coughs> bad odor to itself. Uh, so those are sort of the logical explanations that the court was seeing that Delaware was overly broad in, in its protection of shareholders and when they're in the rep loan moment. And the court just changing the doctrine to say, look, as long as the shareholders approve this thing, that's okay. We, we also offer um, a, 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 a further explanation here, and that is there wasn't enough critical discussion about Revlon itself, the case. The case was a muddied set of facts. You had two bidders for the firm. You had a CEO of bidder number one uh, who uh, was disliked by the CEO of the target firm, Revlon. And so there was a lot of personal animus, a lot of self-dealing 
in the background of the facts of that case. And the consequence is that with just black letter, self-dealing, bad faith kind of arguments that existed in the tapestry of the corporate law of Delaware, it would have been possible to uh, reach the same conclusion that the court reached in Revlon without creating a new doctrine. That is to say, Revlon went off the rails and said, aha, we have a bad case here, but we're going to announce a new standard, the Revlon moment, the duty to shop the firm, without thinking about what the ramifications are, okay? And that just shows you, I think, the danger that we have when you have a, a common law system that we have and you have, okay? Uh, it's nice to proceed incrementally, but it's very dangerous when you start dumping in an entirely new standard that comes with it, okay? So that, that's one of the consequences. And, um, okay, so that's, that's the explanation for what happened in the rebels. The next one is a case called Weinberger. Weinberger is your standard sort of self-dealing situation, but on a grand scale. We know that self-dealing in a corporate enterprise, that you have the CEO of the firm, and the firm is going to buy Blackacre uh, uh, from the CEO. Okay? So the dealings across the table, and already your eyes, or your eyebrows raised, and you say, what, what's going on here? So that's the self deal. Well, Weinberger applies a case situation where you have a 50%, 60%, 70% stockholder who says, well, what I want to do is I want to merge the company I own 50, 60% of the stock in, into myself. And Weinberger applies, sometimes you give them cash, it's a cash out merger, and sometimes you just give them stock. But nonetheless, you have a self dealing transaction. Now, the, the manner of dealing with self dealing, whether it's the law of corporations or the law of trust is to say, wow, we would really like to have an independent voice here, okay? And so Weinberger says, look, when you have one of these self-dealing transactions, Alpha's acquiring beta, and it turns out that Alpha is a controlling stockholder of beta, and we have the odor of self-interest here, what we want to have happen in those transactions is we're going to shift the burden of proof. So the plaintiff normally has the burden of persuasion and the burden of producing evidence, and we're going to shift that burden of proof, and we're going to shift it over to the controlling person. And they have to show, in the Delaware nomenclature, entire fairness. What that means, they have to show that the process that was pursued to be able to accomplish this transaction had good co governance practices associated with it, and that the price was fair. And it's a very holistic inquiry, uh, inquiry into what the price is. Okay? So the burden of proof on them. Well, boy. What happens? If you have a self-dealing transaction, alpha is going to acquire beta, and the alpha has a pre-existing relationship with beta, you just put a hell of a big bullseye on that transaction that says, sue me, okay? Because the, the burden of proof is establishing fairness, holistic inquiry, you know, the settlement value of that is very, very attractive. So to just move this forward, what's happened now is that Delaware, uh, uh, about four years ago, said, look, <coughs> We're going to correct this problem um, um, uh, through governance. And we're just having too many suits here where people are alleging, you're sound dealing, okay? And so what we're going to do is say that the business judgment rule, this presumption of propriety, is restored in these transactions if you do two things. We're going to do both of them. One, you create an independent negotiating committee with the target company. So if Alpha is acquiring Beta and Alpha has a pre-existing relationship with Beta, Beta has an independent committee that negotiates the deal, and they have to have the power to say no. Okay? And, and you also have a minority plebiscite. Okay? That is, you condition the transaction not only on it being negotiated by an independent committee of the board, but you also then have a majority of the independent shareholders have to approve the transaction. So you have both of them. And if you have both of those transactions, then what happens is you have uh, uh, the restore the business judgment rule, the plaintiff has the burden of persuasion, burden of persuading, showing that there's no rational basis for this transaction, blah, blah, blah. So that, that, that's, that's the transaction. Now what explains this? Well, in part the litigation, I, mean, I have to say that. 
But I think also is, is a, a realization that you're just waiting for the cases to come along that presented exactly the right form. Prior litigation, you'd have an independent committee. For prior litigation, you'd have a majority of the minority shareholders. But you'd never combine them together. So finally, they had a set of facts that went to the Delaware courts and the Delaware Supreme Court that had both an independent negotiating committee and a, a shareholder plebiscite, and the court grabbed it. But along the way, the Delaware legislature had enacted a provision, 251H of the Delaware Code, to be exact, that said that, look, if you follow the following steps here, that uh, uh, the first step is you're going to have a tender offer. And if that tender offer gives you 51% ownership, and you disclose in that tender offer that you're going to come back and merge the people into yourself to get the 49% you didn't get for the tender offer. If you do all of that at the get-go and you negotiate that, alpha and beta, when they're not connected together, they're independent, so alpha's going to make a bid and then become a 51% owner. And then after that, it's going to use a straight merger and fold beta into alpha. If you do all that to get the, then that transaction will not be subject to the entire fairness thing. Okay? <clears throat> the legislature said, look, let's handle this, uh, these acquisitions, with some degree of certainty, reduce the litigation. And so I think that's a pretty powerful signal to the court say, look, the legislature makes the laws, and maybe we ought to re-examine this. And then it also goes back to on the books of Delaware for over 60 years was a statute that dealt with self-dealing by officers or directors or when you had common directorships that also policed self-dealing transactions and they did them by a independent board or an independent shareholder vote and all the Delaware courts did is sort of combine them together. So there's another sort of, you know, I think riding the ship in a way that Revlon, I think, that it was a case where the court overreacted and created a new doctrine. Here, I think that what you find in what was happening in the watering down or eviscerating of, of Weinberger is essentially finding that they had ignored a certain body of law, how they regulated insider trade, pardon, and independent um, directors having a role in disciplining and protecting the corporation when there's self-dealing transactions, okay? And they just went back and found that. The, the third case of the Golden Quartet, I'll wrap up here pretty quickly, is the following, and that's Unical. Unical is probably the most cited case in corporate jurisprudence in America. And what Unical, what Unical is all about is say, look, when a company is subject to a takeover, we allow the board of directors to engage in defensive maneuvers. And there's a whole range of defensive maneuvers. But we're going to evaluate those defensive maneuvers, okay, under a two-pronged test. And, and the reason we're doing that, a well, two-pronged special, you don't get the benefit of the business judgment rule. They have to first come in and prove that the directors were independent, they carried out a reasonable investigation, and they believe that there was a threat. Okay, well, we'll come back to the T word in a moment about what the hell a threat is. But believe that there was a threat. And if they bear that burden of proof, then they go to the second level. And, and the Unical had said they had to show that their defensive maneuver for, was proportional to the threat. So not only did the board of directors of the target company have to show that they were independent of management, that they were fully informed, okay, and that they identified a threat. Just stop and think about that. You can hear the lawyers making money on those things. Mm -hmm. How did they think about what the threat was? The lawyers told them what the threat was. Okay? How did they make sure that they made a reasonable investigation? You lock them in a room with a lawyer for nine or ten hours, and what happened in Unical is not just locking them in the room once, they had a meeting that lasted nine hours. And then they went home, they didn't do anything. They came back the next day for another four hours, okay? Just to demonstrate that they had this reasonable investigation. They not, you know, they had 
four investment bankers, Goldman, Sachs, Dillon, and Reed, okay? <laughs> they had all these investment bankers, so you, you're just papering the, the case. Then, on the reasonable portion, that sounds like the court would then be exercising it. Well, the reasonable relationship soon gave way in a case called Unitrim, in which the court come back and says, you know, we're going to look around here and think about whether we really want to have a, be a balancing act. I mean, was the, the, the defensive maneuver disproportionate to what the threat was? And all we're going to say is you can't use a defensive maneuver that's either preclusive or coercive. And, and, and if it's not preclusive or coercive, does it fall in the realm of just being something reasonable that people do to defend control? That was a substantial evisceration, but the really big evisceration was the Del uh, Delaware Supreme Court said threat can mean the, you're good, the bidder, the person trying to take you over, is going to change your business practices. So the Unical itself, the threat was that the bidder was offering too low a price. So it was an inadequate price. And that it was coercive. What it was was saying, look, we're going to offer you $54 a share, and those who acquire that will get $54 cash up to 50, we'll take 51%. And then the other 49%, well, we're going to give you junk bonds that our investment bankers will guarantee will probably be worth in the neighborhood of $54, okay? And so it's coercive, it's front end loaded, you do cash, but junk bonds, I mean, and bankers are going to value it whatever they want to, pretty coercive. So that was coercive and it was an inadequate price. But then the time case comes along and the court says, no, 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 no. A threat could be somebody that's going to change your business practices and your policies. What that meant is that suddenly Unical's operation is based upon business practices and policies. And that looks like the same thing we normally have in law where we don't second guess directors because the business of business is business and if they decide that they want to uh, 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 have three plants and not just two plants, that's their, that's their risk taking, we're not going to disturb it. So, and there we give a high presumption of propriety and that's, that's fine. So one of the things that happens here is that the minute you expand from inadequate price or coercion to suddenly having a, a threat that can be a practice of business policy, it becomes almost indistinguishable from the business judgment rule. But the other force that I think is explaining what, what's happening with Unical is it's really become very passe. Today, activist investors wish to make money. They don't engage in a hostile takeover as often as they did in the past. In fact, you find them very in declining uh, frequency. What they do is they then control, lobby, publicize, and uh, make a short slate proxy solicitation to get themselves into the boardroom. And so the battleground is um, um, today is not tender offers, but the battleground is the activist shareholder wanting to get into the boardroom. And in that context, because it's all surrounded with business policy and practices, the unical litmus, okay, uh, with respect to threat doesn't really work very well. And the courts are then backing off it. Now the final thing I want to say is the one I wish I had more time on, but I'll do it. And so, uh, and that is a Blasius. Blasius could have been the most significant decision handed down in American jurisprudence in the last century because it did the following. And the court decision in Delaware, um, the chancellor, the trial the head, head uh, trial judge in Delaware is the chancellor. The chancellor said, you know, the board of directors has a lot of discretion, a lot of control in managing the corporation's business. Corporate statutes, Delaware statutes, and other statutes in America say, the affairs of the corporation shall be managed by or under the direction of the board of directors corporations affairs. But the shareholders have rights. They don't have a lot of rights. We have less rights here than we have, I mean, less rights in America than you have. America, the shareholders have a falling right. They have a right to, uh, to vote. They have a right to uh, sell their shares. 
they have a, a right to inspect the books and records. And the fourth right, they have the right to sue. Okay? They don't have a lot of rights. They have four rights. Okay? And so what Boston has said is that, look, we have these things called the shareholder franchise. It's limited areas in which the shareholders have authority. And one of them is the right to vote. And the board thwarted that action. You know, That's Alice nice. Corporation board thwarted that action because the shareholder was out actively campaigning to gain control of the board. And the board then took a step at an emergency meeting and thwarted that ongoing exercise of the ability of the shareholders to elect directors. Okay, we'll just leave it at that right now. And so what Boston says, look, this is interfering with the rights of shareholders. This is not a question of managing the company. This goes to the principal <coughs> and agent relationship in which the principal is the shareholder and the agent is the board of directors. And while it's true, shareholders cannot in America tell the directors what to do, but they do select who their agents are going to be. And you're interfering with their ability to select who's going to represent them. And that is not in the statute that says the affairs of the corporation shall be managed. Because this is not about corporate affairs, this is about shareholder affairs. And so what, what Chancellor Allen said in, in that context is that when you're interfering with the basic principal-agent relationship, then you have to have a compelling justification. Okay? Well, suddenly, very rapidly, within a matter of three or four years, the Delaware Supreme Court said, well, this only applies to the voting franchise. It doesn't apply to the suing franchise the selling of shares franchise. If it applied to the selling fr shares franchise, that would destroy something, the major first line of defense called the poison pill. Okay? And so it doesn't apply to those other franchises. It only applies to the <coughs> voting franchise, and it has to have imminent harm uh, to that franchise, and it has to be an ongoing exercise. Of it. So they qualified it substantially, so it really cabinet substantially. Uh, and now you find that even um, um, in an article that he co-authored about seven years ago, Chancellor Allen said, well, maybe I should just handle this in some other way and we shouldn't have had this new uh, 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 fiduciary obligation and this new standard. I think it was, uh, was not a good idea. What explains that? I think what explains that is that it would have been hugely revolutionary if Blasius had had legs in all areas of the shareholder franchise. It would have forced us to rethink a lot of things, let me just take a moment here, okay, that are ongoing. One, the poison pill. Poison pill says <coughs> that if somebody hits a trigger, the triggers are getting lower and lower, but the trigger is now popular trigger is 5%. If somebody acquires more than 5% of the company's stock, then some ca catastrophic event happens to the company. And it blows the company, okay? Mutually assured destruction, okay? That's what the pill is all about. And so nobody wants to hit the trigger, okay? No one wants to hit the trigger, okay? And the result of that is, means bids aren't made and people can't sell their shares. So you know, we, would have a, we would have an adult conversation if Blasius was robust about whether the pill interferes with the shareholder franchise, okay? I'm not saying what the outcome was, but we would at least be open. What about another thing? Interfering with the shareholder's right to sue. Ubiquitous in America now are what's called form selection clauses. With all this litigation that I was talking about earlier about deals, that what you find is that suits are filed not just in Delaware, but lots of places where you could lay venue. And that makes it very difficult when you're settling cases uh, to, to, to figure out who's going to get their case decided first, when, et cetera. And so boards of directors have unilaterally adopted what they call <coughs> form selection bylaws. The directors pass a bylaw that says if shareholders bring a suit against the directors, whether it be in a derivative suit or a class action or an individual suit, the board of directors has a choice about where to litigate and they can choose to litigate in one of the courts where they being sued or in Delaware, form selection. 
Well, if you think about it, a form selection clause flies in the face of the shareholder franchise about the ability to sue, that determines where you're going to be able to sue. And same thing, many corporations in America now are adopting bylaws to constrain the shareholder's ability to be able to get access to books and records to find out if there's wrongdoing, misconduct, what, how to value their shares, etc. These are all being curtailed or qualified by board of directors unilateral adoption. So I think our explanation on Blasius, and just to wrap up here, was that it was too far ahead of its time, that the world was not ready for a robust discussion about what directors might do in managing a company, but where the line is drawn in the sand that they may not cross because they're then intruding in the areas that are basic to share ownership. So thank you for indulging me. Well, Jim, it's, uh, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful that you could come across and, and be with us for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I really enjoyed reading the paper. Um, it's, it's super interesting. And it's great, um, my students in my room, um, to have someone talking about Delaware law who actually really knows what, what Delaware law is about, right? So it, it's brilliant. Because some of these cases, guys, we will be picking up on them. We'll be picking up on Revlon. We'll be picking up on Unicorn, we'll, talk, we'll be talking about them uh, pretty extensively. Um, okay, um, so I've got uh, 10 minutes, okay, to talk about Jim's paper. Uh, Jim's paper is a story really of decline. Decline in uh, the quality of Delaware law, the extent to which Delaware law protects shareholders. But of course, a story of decline uh, depends upon a story of hope uh, that... Uh, these standards, when they were first in introduced, really did offer us something. Um, um, there needs to be hope before, of course, we can be disappointed. Um, and, and the idea in Jim's paper is that uh, the 1980s uh, were, were a, a glorious age. Now, I completely agree with the fact that the 1980s were a glorious age. Right? The 1980s were a time of great music, yes. uh, you know, uh, <laughs> great... Uh, Hair. Even in the 1980s, <laughs> I had great hair, right? Um, it was a wonderful time. It was a time when I felt safe, but maybe I look at the 1980s through rose-colored spectacles. It was also a period of decline. Uh, it was a period of recession. It was a period of poverty. It was a period of social conflict. It was a period in which we lived under the threat of annihilation. So maybe the 80s weren't that great. And I, and I wonder, Jim, whether you also look at the 1980s through rose-colored spectacles, and whether, when it comes to Revlon and Unicol in particular, you present it in a way that maybe has too much hope and doesn't actually get what those cases were really all about. Guilty as charged. Um, so in your paper, Jim talks about a weakening. He talks about an evisceration uh, of, of the Revlon standards. I'm just going to talk about, about Revlon. Um, and, and I'll, I'll take a short second to explain Revlon in a bit of detail, Jimmy, because I know that given how much reading I'm giving some of my students at the moment, I know that many of them will not have, have, have read your paper. So um, in Revlon, um, uh, um, uh, uh, there was a bid made for Revlon by a company called Pantry Pride, and Revlon was not happy about that at all. And it engaged in some initial defensive maneuvers. The first one, the first defensive maneuver was to... Uh, uh, offer a share for note exchange. So in exchange for shares, you would give them a very, very favorable note. That note contained covenants. Covenants that said the company would not take on any more debt. Uh, co covenants that the note owner was valued. Now, that covenant could be waived with board approval. Uh, but for some reason, the note holders didn't think it would be waived. But Pantry Pride didn't go away. 
Okay, so the company had to look for another alternative, and they found another alternative in the guise of a, of a private equity company called Forceman. They agreed to deal with Forceman, but part of that deal involved the waiving of that covenant on the notes. What happened to the notes? They crashed. What happened to the note holders? They got very angry. They started calling up the directors. They started to threaten to sue the directors. The directors got very worried. So the directors went back to Forceman and said, guys, you know, that." People are threatening us to sue us. What can we do? And said, Forsman said, I will agree to hold the value of those notes at par value if you agree a very favorable lockup. And that lockup involved an option to buy part of the company for less than 200 million than it was worth, uh, and as well a termination fee of, I think, 25 million. So you know, it's not bad, right? Uh, a, a effectively, a lockup of 225 million. And that was <coughs> what the court was asked to whether or not that lockup was acceptable. And the court said no. The court threw that lockup out. And Revlon is remembered in that decision for throwing that lockup out and saying it was unlawful for these things called Revlon duties. Now, these Revlon duties that Jim refers to, and that Jim's talking about decline, these Revlon duties involve pretty much the following things a duty to maximize value in the context of a contested auction. You've got to maximize value. Secondly, a duty to make reasonable decisions. The standard by which the decision would be judged was not a rationality standard, but a reasonable standard, whether a reasonable director would have made that decision. Thirdly, the duty of care in the context of a contested uh, auction was a duty to, make, to engage in a reasonable process, which in the United States is a lot higher than the standard process requirement, which is a gross negligence requirement. So that is how Revlon is remembered. Okay, and here's an example of, of another case which refers to Revlon making those points. The key features of an enhanced scrutiny test are A, a judicial determination regarding the adequacy of the decision-making process, B, a judicial examination of the reasonableness of the director's actions in light of the circumstances then existing. So maximize value, reasonable decisions, reasonable process. Now, Jim, in your paper, you said Revlon could have decided the decision differently. The court could have decided according to traditional rules. Now, I think when you look at Revlon, I think that's exactly what it did. Yeah. So Revlon didn't really offer any great hope. Now, in the United States, uh, as we'll discover um, in a couple of weeks in my takeovers course, there are three standards of review. There's a business judgment standard, enhanced scrutiny, and entire fairness. Business judgment standard applies to a bog standard business judgment and it's rationality review. If you've got a rational basis for the decision, you're fine. Enhanced scrutiny uh, it comes out of uh, defensive takeovers and applies a tougher standard where there appears to be significant indirect conflicts. And finally, entire fairness is applied where there is a direct conflict, like in a self-dealing situation. Um, now, in Revlon, the court applied enhanced scrutiny. As, as Jim says, enhanced scrutiny comes from this case, Unicorn. And enhanced scrutiny has two components. The first component is <clears throat> the directors have to show that there are reasonable grounds that there is a threat to corporate policy and effectiveness. Now, that sounds like a reasonable standard, but it's not. This standard comes from a 1963 case called Chef. Chef said you have to show reasonable grounds that there is a threat to corporate policy and effectiveness. In Chef, the court used corporate power to buy back shares at a premium to make a uh, bidder who they didn't like go away. But the court in Chef said in order to prove that there is reasonable grounds, to, uh, reasonable grounds for a threat to corporate policy and effectiveness, you have to show good faith and reasonable investigation. Now the good news is, Jim, that this afternoon in my UK takeover uh, corporate law class, we were talking about the UK standard of good faith. Okay, and exploring what that meant. And in Chef, the standard meant pretty much what it used means in the UK. Right? You have to use corporate power in good faith to further the corporate interest. How does the court work that out? Because courts have no access to what's inside someone's head. Okay, what they do then is they look for rational reasons that might support the decision as proxies for good faith. And that's what they did in Chef. Uh, they looked at rational reasons that might support the decision, and they found those in reasons such as protecting employees, making employees feel more comfortable so that they would be more productive. Now, in Unicol, the court applied a second part of the test. They said it's not enough just to demonstrate good faith and reasonable investigation. 
In addition to that, because of uh, the conflict that arises in a takeover context, we are also going to ask whether, as Jim said, the defense that you used was reasonable in relation to the threat posed. And as Jim said, that's a proportionality standard. Okay, this is, these standards are not asking the question, was the decision a decision that a reasonable director would make? The decisions involve, first, a testing of good faith by rationality standards, and secondly, looking at what you have done to see whether what you have done is closely tailored to the reason you gave for action. Because if it is closely tailored, then that suggests you're behaving loyally. If it's not closely tailored, it suggests you're behaving disloyally. Neither of these two standards, although they use the word reasonable, are about decisions that a reasonable average director would make. Okay, taking it too much time, but I'll be through quite quickly. As to be as known, they always take way too long. Um, so in Revlon, the court applied those standards. Why? Because the court concluded that the lockups were being used defensively to prefer enforcement against the bidder they didn't like, pantry, pantry pride. The court in Revlon says the following thing. Okay, now, the Revlon board argued that the reason they put in place those lockups was to protect the note holders. Because as a result of the proposed takeover, the value of the notes had crashed. And the reason they gave for their action for entering into this lockup of effectively $250 million was that they needed to do so to protect the note holder's interest, because Forceman was going to hold those notes at par value. The court of Revlon rejects that proposition. And the court says the Revlon board argued that it acted in good faith in protecting the note holders, because Unicol permits consideration of other corporate constituencies. Do I have a... Does it work? Hmm. Although such considerations may be permissible, there are fundamental limitations upon that prerogative. A board may have regard for various constituencies in discharging its responsibilities, provided there are rationally related benefits accruing to the stockholders. Good faith is tested by rational reasons, but those rational reasons have to be connected to the interests of stockholders. <clears throat> now, some of the time, stakeholder interests are connected to shareholder interests. Sometimes it's good to treat your employees well because they become more productive, they make more money, shareholders generate more value. Sometimes it's good uh, to look out for your community uh, as a business because you generate a good reputation, people like your business, people buy your products. Um, but in the context of an auction when you're selling your business, the court said it, rational reasons have to be connected to shareholder value. In the context of an auction, Non-stockholder interests are not relevant anymore. Such concern for, for non-stockholder interests is inappropriate when an auction among active bidders is in progress, and the object no longer is to protect or maintain the corporate enterprise, but to sell it to the highest bidder. All this makes perfect sense within the good faith framework. Good faith is tested by regard to rational reasons that are connected to shareholder interests. The, the board in Revlon said they were acting in the interest of note holders, which was a legally non-cognizable rational reason, because it was wholly unrelated to the interest of uh, the shareholders. Um, what you see here in Revlon is a straightforward application of the first part of Chef, the good faith standard. There's nothing, I don't think, anything new in this at all. Now, so, uh, Revlon offered a rational reason must be connected to shareholder value. The reason was not connected to shareholder value in Revlon. In a breakup setting, you have to maximize value because the shareholders have no future. Stockholder regarding interest don't make sense. Um, but it was a duty to maximize value. It was not a duty to maximize value, but a duty to have a rational account of why what you did furthered value. Now, it is true that Revlon had regard to the second part of Unicol as well. It concluded, under such circumstances, we must conclude that the merger agreement with Forceman was unreasonable in relation to the threat posed. I don't really understand, Jim, to be honest, why they dealt with the second part, because know. the first yeah. part basically dealt with everything. Yeah. If you're not acting in good faith, it's a done deal, so there's no need to talk about anything else. But in Revlon, there was no requirement to make a reasonable decision. Revlon, interestingly, doesn't even talk about care. There's no regard to care at all. So, the, for me, the interesting thing, really, and, and the, the puzzle, is 
<clears throat> why we have come to understand Revlon in this way, in this demanding way, in this hopeful way. Um, I, because for me, Revlon um, didn't really offer anything new at all when you look closely at it. So I, to, to, to conclude, Jim, I wonder whether your story of decline is dependent upon an over-optimistic okay. story of, of the original cases. And I think you could probably make a similar argument with Unicorn. Okay. Yeah, put up the slides. We'll get you out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, thanks for having me and um, giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts in this wonderful paper, which I truly enjoyed reading, and um, where um, I really have a gigantic task in the sense that. Um, this is a paper, as you all know, um, by now, it is um, an inside of Fool's story told about the law of Delaware. And uh, David has made a very interesting intervention by saying, okay, look, you even got Delaware law wrong, maybe it's different. And my challenge was, at least the judge from Carson's email there when you invited me, you give the German view on all of that. So the question is, of course, what's the German view on that? I think there is no German view on that. It's just very interesting. But I can somehow put that into context. And I give the German view in the sense that I uh, wear a double-breasted suit with a tie, so that's very German. Well, it's an English tie and an Italian, uh, English suit and an Italian tie, but anyway. So the point that I try to make is um, I'd be super liberal with what I say about this paper because I take the liberty to uh, take an eclectic approach. So I just want to push you, uh, James, a little bit on the broader context. I think that goes into the same direction, but less with uh, regard to the doctrinal details that David was making. Um, if the paper, uh, if the narrative of the paper is correct, I want to know a little bit more about the hoax story, as David has termed it. So these cases, the Golden Four uh, cases, the quartet doesn't come out of nowhere. So it would be interesting to learn what the general mood in, of the 1980s in this regard was and, and why it maybe vanished or where it went and everything. And of course, now being invited to speak about the German perspective, I'm going to talk a little bit about Germany's close relatives to these four cases, actually, because they exist. And then I'll go back to broaden the picture and talk a little bit about context again. So the context um, of the changes of the overhaul of the Delaware case law, which is institutional master capitalism as we now know it. And of course, there are some normative implications here. Um, and that is, of course, something that's very much in the debate, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these, much more from a finance perspective than from a legal perspective. So um, the question is, is there a common normative theme that underpins these cases in the 1980s? So because, as I will show you in a second, in Germany, you can't really pin that down to an activist judiciary that at that point, I mean, if we're talking about activist judiciary in the corporate law context, that's always very relative in terms, right? They're not going for the big social questions, but at least they have the proclivity to do something that is not necessarily enshrined in the law. And they, they invent new doctrines, and that is very much uh, present in Germany too. And the interesting thing is that there you can actually make a case that this is related to an ethical stance that these judges are taking that is well prepared in the literature. So there's a connection between the legal uh, scholarship and also what, what pops up in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the adjudication. And I think this is worth exploring whether something like that uh, exists in Delaware too. Um, the, the background is particularly interesting for me because uh, the, the, the authors of the paper tell a very consistent and almost linear story. So uh, there's a development which is of hope and decline, or however you want to put it. Um, and of course, it is interesting why uh, some of these events really occur over decades and others occur just very recently. Of course, the explanation that James was giving is, well, there has been this illusion of litigation. Fine, but why uh, has that been a concern earlier? Uh, because I think that the bar has always been pretty inventive in, in making up new uh, uh, bonanzas for, for, their, for the trade. So um, 
relate this whole thing to also the scholar discourse that has been uh, consistently going on in the U.S. and has been shaping corporate law, because many of these judges uh, of the Delaware Chancery Court, particularly the Delaware Supreme Court, not only Leo Strine, who's now uh, the Chief Justice, but also others, have been very, very much attuned to this discourse. So, so maybe this is an influence which also drives this. Now, very, very short, uh, for Germany, there is a, a very close cousin, or a cousin uh, to the Basis case, uh, which is this very German uh, word here, Holzmo. It's a, it's, a, it's a firm that's the, the name of the firm. And what happened here is the following. It's, at, at first sight, it's not a very uh, prominent transaction, but what the management did is they simply spun off 80% of the firm's assets into a subsidiary. So nothing goes out of the firm, but the problem is, of course, if you have 80% of the assets in the subsidiary, any decision that you want to take that usually involves shareholders, where they have to consent, now is done in the subsidiary, where, of course, the management of the firm votes the shares, because it is in the business of actually running the firm, and that involves that they're also taking care of the subsidiaries that they are. And this is, of course, a tremendous growth in power. Uh, so it's sort of a self, it's a, it's a power grab by management. And that is something that the courts in Germany didn't like. And they, uh, out of the blue, without any statutory uh, clear, clear, clear connection to the corporate statute, they invented uh, uh, a requirement for shareholder consent to the spin-off transaction. So it's not in the law, and, and I'm sorry to destroy your idea of uh, 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 continental European judges being the robo-justices <laughs> that simply apply the law <laughs> like machines. They don't. They actually also dream up doctrines, and then they come about with them. And it's quite interesting that just like Basis, the, the wording, the holding of this case is so broad that it can make a huge difference with regard to the division of powers and competences between the board and uh, shareholders. And what happens is that all of a sudden they also get scared and say, like, oh, we didn't want that. I mean, this is, goes way too far. So later cases start to massively qualify. This also with regard to at least what, what was perceived as frivolous litigation. I'm going to say a little bit about that too. Now, <clears throat> what is the, 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 the main explanation that I as, at least see in the paper, uh, what is it about? So we see a strong deferral of Delaware courts to shareholder consent because they don't like shareholder litigation if you really look at the, uh, 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 the different remedies that, that are present uh, in shareholder litigation. So sure, we have more sophisticated investors. So it makes sense to say, OK, maybe the idea that the shareholders are just as stupid to understand, maybe let's just defer to their vote. Because now, of course, we have these institutional investors, which have the potential to indeed understand these transactions. However, there is an important qualification, which is the typical institutional investor is not interested in firm level governance. They don't want to know. They don't want to investigate. Their business is Risk management by portfolio construction. That's what they do. They don't want to know about the nitty gritty of uh, firm level governance. So if they are compelled to vote, if they have to vote on a transaction, which is not a big one, then they simply rely on proxy advisors. And the interesting thing is here, I ha happened to have, or I had the chance uh, to teach a class with Leo Strine. And that was about proxy advisors. And his stance, whether really, proxy advisors is, well, you know, child abuse, proxy advisors, they're pretty much the same reality. So uh, Leo Streisberg is not a friend of this. And so I would like to know more about uh, whether he really, or what, what, what you think is really the underlying uh, idea here. Is it really that simple to say shareholders now are smarter? Um, and that's why. But the fact that that means we're relying more on, share, uh, on, on proxy advisors. Um, and there's also quite interesting uh, research in finance, which says, OK, look, if you increase shareholder involvement in certain firm level decisions, that means you rely on proxy advisors that actually increases firm value. That's totally plausible, because as long as the decision is with the board that's relatively disinterested, then, of course, you have precisely this firm level knowledge which shapes the decision, whereas if uh, you rely on proxy advisors, they don't have firm level knowledge. So it's a necessary. Uh, 
almost, or at least intuitive, and it's a nicely published paper in JF, the Journal of Finance, so that's, I think, a very plausible story here. Um, so what we see is probably a division of labor, labor between activist investors and these relatively passive institutional investors, as has been shaped in a very nice article by Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon. And the activists are really looking for the big ones, the big points. They're looking for transactions where they can actually strategically turn around the firm and then by that make a massive profit. So shareholder involvement, deferral to shareholder vote, maybe something that works in the age of, sh of agency capitalism, of shareholder capitalism nicely if we're talking about big decisions. And that's why I think your story is somewhat plausible. It needs some qualification in saying, okay, look, these are the big ones, right? The golden quartet are probably the big ones. Plausi is less, but uh, the other ones are the big cases, and that's why it probably works. And then, of course, my last point is, well, this, the paper is very nicely done, and the doctrinal details are just brilliantly made. But I think that the normative implications of all this are a little bit unclear, because I don't know if you really like it or if you don't. Because <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you read the, the chapter about Blasius, I have the impression you don't like it, because you would love to test how far that actually goes. Whereas in others, you say, OK, this is frivolous litigation, um, and, and we don't like that. And here comes my question, frivolous litigation. Well, that's easy said, but really? Because you can think of wrong people doing for the wrong reasons the right thing. So, you know, this has a policing function. I mean, the plaintiff's bar is the driver, but we don't really know whether it's good or bad, because policing corporate governance carries a huge positive externality, which goes beyond the firm. So you, you have this one case, but of course, even with regard to the single firm, it has an implication for other corporate governance decisions. Because if you know there's someone who goes after me, if I do something wrong, you will be more careful in the future. You will be more diligent in the future. And that, if you know the market is structured as this, is a positive externality across firms. So one litigation has a huge impact across the market. And this is why I'm also a little bit skeptical. I mean, you're, you're citing this, the, these papers, Jill Fish and others that look at certain indicators. Um, what are the payouts to litigate parties? But you know, in, the, in light of these positive externalities, that's not a very good indicator of what's actually going on uh, on the social level. So I don't think that you need to explore, you can't explore this big question in your paper. I mean, you can't do everything at once. But I think um, at least a hint uh, at this possibility would be nice, and I think I'm done. Thanks for a great week, and good luck with that paper. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have exactly 21 minutes left until 8. There we are. Um, I, th I think if, if you want to, um, it might be useful if you just take, before I open it up to the floor, if you want to take two minutes to res very, very briefly yeah, to, res well, to respond wanna, to uh, I David's reflon point yeah, and yeah. to, well, tell us a little bit about your assessment, whether you think, um, reflecting what Tobias said, whether you think um, there is an overarching theme and Delaware moves in the direction of um, an inefficient solution that is driven by, by interests or whether it, it, it truly takes into account um, that shareholder structure has changed, sophistication of, of investors has changed. Okay, so, so very, very briefly, well, one, thanks for resurrecting Chef, because that's what I, I learned when I was in law school. So and then it got overtaken uh, uh, when I began teaching and by other cases. So I'll, I'll go back and look at that, but I think, it, I, think the, 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 I, I don't have any reason to disagree that the Revlon was just playing off the themes that were there. And then on, on, the, on the normative take about where things are, uh, Randall, my co-author on this paper, and I haven't totally figured out what the normative, but we, uh, when I leave uh, London on November 5th, I'm flying to Miramar with my wife, and we're meeting Randall, who frequently travels with us, and I can assure you, over many cold beers, this will be resolved. Uh, but, but, my, but, my, so, but my thinking is, going back to what was happening uh, to me like that, is I do think that Delaware uh, was captured to some extent by the Chicago School a little bit in the 80s. On the, on the sort of, there were these wonderful articles that were uh, dashed off by um, 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 Daniel Fischel and Frank Easterbrook 
and about management passivity. And I think that really captured things. And then you mentioned the, you know, the, the work of, 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 of um, Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon and the role that activist investors, I think that now, to some extent, the court's responding to that thing. Well, we have these people out there as a force, and they, they're, they're all big boys and girls, and they got a hell of a lot of money, and they can raise a lot of money, so let's just let's, let's let them fight it out, but not going to help them with any legal. Those are possibilities. Uh, and where I think this is going to happen, head out normatively, uh, I'm interested in telling the story that, uh, about the shareholder franchise. And uh, I'm not, I think Unical and Revlon are somewhat passe these days. But if I could ever do anything to make people think that there was a kernel of a thought there about protecting shareholders in certain limited areas, I would like to. So we'll have to see how I can take the strength of that part of the argument. And that's purely a political argument on my part. It's not a legal argument, but it's where you know, I weep for the shareholders. So, so some do it for Argentina, I do it for shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's open it up to, to questions from the floor. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you very much. I was wondering if in the rise and fall of shareholder rights, you see any place for stakeholder rights? Uh, because it was mentioned before that uh, it's, they're often used as justification for directors to make certain decisions, but in the case of there's no real discussion about what rights they may have. So do you see an improvement in that? So that, that battle has been pretty much resolved, unfortunately, in the U.S. Uh, on the idea that the only stakeholder is a common stockholder, if not the preferred stockholder, if not a bondholder, if not your customers, et cetera. It's not something I necessarily agree with, uh, that, that outcome. But we sort of stayed away from it. And since we're writing a paper about Delaware, that Delaware is actually has a wonderful, wonderful case that came out of Craigslist, no less, an international firm, about this, which Delaware comes four square, that the purpose and mission of the corporation is to operate for a profit for your common stockholders. And the fact that Craigslist was getting into a battle uh, uh, with eBay, uh, which owned a third of them. Uh, eBay said, look, you should start charging for these classifieds. And the two founders of Craigslist, Craig and whoever the other person is, said, no, 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 we, this is our community spirit thing. This is, where we, you know, this is where our roots are. And Delaware said, that's not a good cause and, uh, for doing like that. So that, unfortunately, the water is on the bridge there. And, um, um, and so um, I didn't, didn't take it on. Good point, though. Yeah. Then, um, David. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you there. In, terms, in Delaware, you know, it's, the battle has been fought and lost. But, but, but there, there is hope there if you're interested in, in, in stakeholder regarding concerns in, in the United States. I mean, in many other states, apart from Delaware, um, the corporate purpose can be a, a, a balance between shareholder and stakeholder interest. And, of course, there's this new thing called the B Corp. I don't know really how, how important yeah. that is, but... The B Corp offers the yep. opportunity to have a stakeholder regarding uh, approach to your corporate life. And uh, I understand that there's a B Corp going to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange for the first time. So uh, there's a sense in which these, 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 there's a new vehicle that offers some hope um, if you're sick of Delaware's approach to shareholder <laughs> primacy, right? So, so, so I, I just, just to redeem myself, so you know, the, the stale fish and tomatoes are coming my way. So there are another avenue of things I've been writing about which brings back that, and that is to say that uh, there's a series of cases in Delaware that talk about the monitoring obligations of directors on compliance programs and looking at risk. And you can bring, and I've tried to bring in a lot of these social things. One of my favorite one is the Massey Mines case, and, you know, it's a, a, a West Virginia coal company that believed that uh, um, labor was expendable, their lives were expendable. And the big, the biggest coal mine disaster, 46 people perished uh, as a result of them not complying with federal, and state, and local laws about safety. And Delaware threw the book at them, as a matter of fact. And you can do a lot of language in that that you can pick up other safety issues to start bringing in the need to sort of protect. Because I think we're all we're all at mercy of corporations, whether it be 
you know, drugs or uh, uh, that we may be taking about uh, too rapid approval or uh, not rapid enough. So you can bring it in through that way, and that's, that's what I tried to do it that way. Yeah. I think the audience is a bit exhausted. You have, you have been teaching too, too much. Well, today. Um, because thank you yeah. very much. I found uh, many things enlightening. I wasn't aware of the Czech case, so I also thought that uh, Revlon was introducing something new, so that's, that's good to know. Um, I guess I was drawing some parallels from the different discussions. One was um, that a comparison was made between Blasius and Holtz Moller. Is that correct? Mm. I was just wondering if they dealt with a similar issue of trying to. Um, protect shareholders in a way which uh, enforces or creates a new duty. Um, I, I think the rationale of not intervening between the dynamics of this principal agent relationship was made clear um, in the US from what you told us. I'm just wondering if there are parallels to be drawn uh, with the German case on that, because I guess the rationale behind the outcome is what is more important yeah. than. So that's maybe one point which I found interesting. And then, um, also, drawing again parallels, in one case, I guess, it was mentioned that shareholders aren't interested in participating and managing companies, and they're more interested in the risk management of the portfolio, whereas at the outset, I guess, it, 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 the comment was made that actually they're not interested in taking over, but rather using informal means other than voting by actually getting into the board. And I think that come across different kinds of literature which have this contrast. And I was just wondering whether you are also talking about different types of activists and that maybe there's any point to be made about who, who exactly, or in what yeah. jurisdiction. So um, <clears throat> I think that um, the point that I was making with regard to the different types of institutional investors, I think that's the, that's the story that I'm telling. There are some that run a portfolio essentially based on standard finance theory that, of course, that makes a lot of sense. But that means, means that you're taking very, very little stakes in a lot of firms. And that means that, of course, uh, if you re-engage in firm-level corporate governance, meaning you want to be informed about what's going on in this firm, you incur costs. And that simply means that these costs have to be somehow offset by a probabilistic payout that comes from this engagement. But that, that, that may be so, but then there is a free rider problem, which is if you're running a portfolio across the market, you know that your competitors are essentially holding the same portfolio. So if you are the one who's engaging in corporate governance issues, incurring the costs that are associated with that, then you have a competitive disadvantage because even if the success is there, even if there is a payout, uh, all the others who have been passive also incur precisely that payout. And that means that as a classical portfolio investor, you don't want to do that, which is something why stewardship, for example, is for many, many of these institutions such a uh, stupid idea. But in any case, uh, then, and that's the, that's the story that Jeff uh, and Ron are telling in their paper, is there are others out there uh, who also run minority stakes, which are activist investors. And their business model is entirely different because they don't compete with other portfolio investors, they have idiosyncratic investment st strategies. The, the only thing that matters is total return. And with a low percentage that they also have, because they don't usually run minor majority stakes, um, they need support uh, by other investors. And that is when they start talking, they, they, they come up with something and then they start talking to the passive ones. And that's where a you know, portfolio manager, an asset manager in a passive firm starts to listen because then they say, okay, these are the ones who know, maybe they have a story, I just listen. And then all of a sudden the majority stake against management builds up and that's just how it works. And that's the idea, uh, but that only works if the activists are interested. And they are not interested in policing day-to-day, -day, for example, related part transactions. They're not interested in that because there's not much to be gained from that. So that's, I think, the, the, the first story and the second point with regard to the parallels between uh, the two, I think they are there very massively because it's really the idea that um, there is a reason why shareholders have their, their voting rights, the franchise. And if you start meddling with that, that is really a problem because then of course the, the, the residual control function that shareholders have really vanishes. 
And that's very, very clear. And, and then, of course, it becomes a story how uh, well self-conscious as a, as a judge you are that you can actually help shareholders in this regard. And I think that the 1980s cases in both Delaware and in Germany show a very high belief that judges can help, which then, of course, translates into a lot of litigation that you don't want to see. And then at, at some point, they say, OK, maybe we're just not right in this position. It should be for more. So I just want to share one point about the Delaware judiciary. Uh, it's an uh, interesting judiciary that has some common things uh, with um, um, Japan. Who would ever think that? The following. The judiciary is uh, selected by people who came out of a corporate practice, litigation or a desk practice, usually some litigation. So they have some affinity for group. They're actually chosen at a pretty early age, and they serve terms. Uh, they're not for life, they're like a federal judge. And so they're rolling out of that, and the point is they're rolling out of that just about the time their kids are out of braces, their kids are in college. And you're starting to worry about your health care. And so you have to worry about where your next landing is going to be. And this is something that struck me when I, I did a study of the Japanese judicial system some time ago. I thought about, gee, they point all these people. And they give them a term, but it sort of ends when they're like 61 or 62, and they still have to work like that. You know, you, you're not a bomb thrower if you think you've got to get a job in commerce. That's my point, okay? And so they're, you know, they're, 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 they're moderating influence. The other thing I'm going to say about Delaware, Delaware doesn't win as a state by getting rid of shareholder litigation. You know, it wins by just having the right amount. Sure, right? Because the revenues of that state are not just the franchise fees, which are 20% of the total tax revenues of the state. <coughs> it's just by people thanking the annual filings there. The real goose to the economy there is through people having litigation in Delaware. They're staying in Delaware hotels, eating in Delaware restaurants, okay, doing Delaware depositions like that. This is a big revenue source for that state, you know, which is, its footprint is about like metropolitan London. Okay, so so it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political act that's going on here. So maybe we're seeing a little bit of a pushback here with Corwin and C and J and stuff like that. But this pendulum just keeps swinging around here, and so that's part of the story. I think it's a great story about what was going on in the '80s. It could well be that they were a little revenue short at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie. I, I you may have just answered this question, but it was just occurring to me that, I mean, if you want to reduce shareholder litigation, as we have in some jurisdictions, you do check the rules on costs. Yeah. It's a quicker and easier way. You don't have to take away people's rights to litigate. Yeah. You just make sure there's a penalty if you bring useless, worthless litigation. Yeah. And I just wondered whether there is no hint of that coming in Delaware or anywhere else that could do that? Well, it's cropping in because I mentioned the uh, form selection clauses and on the heels of that was a, uh, a, a, a case involving the, the, the German tennis group uh, that was in Delaware and that was going to have fee shifting bylaws. And that really energized Delaware to do two things. The legislature in, in general session uh, did two things. One, authorized form selection clauses, okay, legitimize them, and prohibited fee shifting. <laughs> so there you are. So it goes back to my comments about you know, getting just the right amount of um, um, tables filled in restaurants. <laughs> Maybe I can come in here, or, well, I, I have a question on the political economy dimension, yeah. but let's, let's, yeah. let's first, um, I'm just curious about the Revlon yeah. case. Why do the note holders accept notes whose value is linked to a covenant the board could, you know, essentially remove one away? They had faith in their board of directors, and boy, were they vulnerable. Because what happened, they had these covenants, they issued the notes, the, that's a securities transaction, and then shortly after that, they had this white knight, Terry Forsman, who shows up, and so the implication of talking about inferences and uh, implications are that they were talking to about a white knight for whom they would have to waive the covenants because the covenants had no, okay, prevented later acquired debt. 
And so they, they must have known when they, when they issued the notes, and so they were lying when they issued the notes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the, on the case, there's nothing to suggest, you know, why they didn't take notes apart from the fact maybe they hadn't read the covenant properly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, because the court is very clear about it. Look, there is a covenant. It can be exercised if the board of directors, uh, can we waive? Did the board of directors say it can be waived? And it's been waived. Hard luck. It's the dream case for a securities litigator. Okay, let me come in now. I think that's my, my opportunity now. Um, I wanted to, I'm still interested in the, in the normative dimension, if you like, and, and uh, tied into that is our questions about political economy and uh, regulatory capture or capture by the Chicago School, which you mentioned just now, which, which I thought was a very interesting thought. Um, when I'm, st I'm still a bit confused about the message, and I know it will be resolved in Myanmar, I think, um, but maybe I, I would be interested in, 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 in a little bit more about that. Um, so when you sent me initially the abstract for the talk, I thought there, there would be a very clear message yeah. by Jim Cox, and that is that the judges in Delaware have been have fallen victim to regulatory or judicial yeah. capture. It didn't sound like that at all now in your presentation. And I'm, I'm trying to make, make sense of what really is going on in Delaware. If you, if you start in the 1980s and you, you say there are some signs of, of capture by the Chicago School, right. if you look at Revlon, yes, probably to some extent, or at Blasius, and and um, the and Delaware realized the courts realized that, and so they cut back on these precedents. Yeah. So you could interpret what happened after the 1980s not so much as a decline, but as a calibration, because at least if you take at face value what what they say in 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 um, many decisions, they the the judges try to calibrate the interests on the one hand of investors, and they are very much aware of problems such as the uh, explosion of delitigation, et cetera, and on the other hand, the interests of uh, the, the directors in running the company unopposed, or making the business decisions unopposed. And I, I think that approach, which, which you see very clearly in time, I, I wouldn't see time as a, I wouldn't see that case very critically, and you could also, I guess, see the the amplifications of Blasius in, in, in that, that you discuss in the paper in that light, and that makes very clear that the court tries to yeah. to have this uh, balance. And so one one other thought about that, in order to introduce also the comparative dimension. This is a little bit an off the cuff remark, and it's probably a bit impossible to comment on that. But I my my intuitive impression is that the Delaware courts so far have achieved to do that in a, in a fantastic way, to calibrate these different in incentives. And that has probably contributed in some way to the success of Delaware corporations. If you look at data, for example, on R&D investment, US corporations are far ahead, certainly of corporations in the UK, also if, if I remember the data correctly, of companies in Germany. And um, so I'm wondering if, one of probably many reasons can be found in, in uh, the approach of the Delaware courts. So, so a couple of things. On, on, on the bottom line where I, I think this paper will turn out is I uh, sparked me writing another paper, which I you know, didn't bore you with. But I think it'll come out on the side that we probably want to have judges being referees in these transactions because at the core of the, Revlon and uh, Unical and uh, even Weinberger, and to that matter, Blasius, is you have the exercise of controlling influence, which always needs to have a, a, you know, a, a, a close look at it. And so we're saying that. And I don't buy the idea of the ma majority of the minority vote. So the, the paper I'm writing is why why shareholders can't approve, cannot approve of uh, 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 things involving litigation. So that's what, so I think it will come out on, on, on that scale. Uh, you know, the, the your, your, your second point was, I, mean, I just lost it. Well, it was maybe a bit rambling. My, my yeah, question no, 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 So the, like. the, 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 the calibration is that they, oh, that yeah, they, I think they're terrifically good. And so, so here's my deal. 
if, if, if this was happening, if, what, if the litigation explosion were happening in the federal courts or in California or Texas or any other place like that, I would have a very different political makeup probably than I have right now on these issues. Because right now I'm willing to say let's have the litigation and let's get it out. Delaware has this very expedited, it's the most efficient resolution place like that. I mean, you have these very complicated cases and in a, in a period of time of 60 days, you have a transcript that's produced in a trial, an appeal that's taken, and a judgment that's handed down, okay? I'm talking about the time case and all, you know, all the cases I mentioned like that were litigated in less than 60 days from the moment you filed the goddamn complaint. So like that. I mean, they're really good about handling, handling it and, and they ride roughshod on discovery. It's not like the other, you know, everything goes in every place. Like you can't go looking for uh, the kitchen sink. They, they, you, know, like you give it here, you get three days, and you, know, you can spend some resources. Like so they really do a good job. So that, I think that actually bolsters my case for thinking about, you know, let's, let's have these cases, and get them up there and have a fresh <laughs> pair of eyes take a look at it. And maybe, maybe there's skullduggery on only one out of 20 cases. But I think that's a pretty good important message for that one case, quite frankly, for the other, others. It's eight o'clock, or actually two minutes past mm -hmm. eight. If there's one very pressing last question, we can probably take that. Um, I think we should call it a day. So thank you very much, Jim and David and Tobias. Thank you.